Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to our presentation. My name is Adam, and my teammates are Alejan, Pavlo, and Riley. And we'd like to tell you about Bastion, which is the project we've been working on for the past few months. We'll start off by discussing what a backend as a service is and where Bastion fits in relative to current backend as a service offerings. Next, we'll give you an overview of Bastion, including its components and features. And then we'll talk about the design decisions that we made when designing and building Bastion. We'll give you an overview of Bastion's architecture and talk about some of the interesting challenges that we encountered while building Bastion. Next, we'll do a demo. We'll talk about future work we'd like to accomplish and we'll end with a question and answer session. Okay, so let's dive in. So first I'll give you a two sentence summary of Bastion. Bastion is an open source customizable backend as a service solution that gets deployed with AWS resources. Bastion is flexible and extensible, integrating with AWS Lambda to provide cloud code functionality for custom use cases. So basically Bastion is a pre-built backend that front-end developers can use for their application so that they don't have to spend time building their own backend letting them get their product to market faster. So before we talk more about Bastion's use case and features, I wanna back up and provide the context for our project. A web application can be thought of in two parts, the front end and the back end. The front end is the client facing code that runs in browsers and mobile apps that's responsible for the user interface. The back end stores the information needed by the front end in the database and keeps track of changes that result from user interactions on the front end. The backend is also responsible for user authentication and for connections to external services. So as an example, let's consider Fortress.io, a small company with a handful of engineers developing a new application. Their application is focused on customer facing features. So they're going to be mainly focused on the front end code, but they still need some kind of backend for their application. Specifically, they need a relatively simple backend that keeps track of their users' data and files and handles user authentication but they have a couple of other requirements too. Their application makes use of external APIs. So they need a way to integrate their backend with those APIs. And like many new companies, they want to prototype quickly and get their product to market as fast as possible. So what are Fortress IO's options for their backend? In the past, they might've developed their backend themselves by developing a backend from scratch and purchasing their own hardware to host it on. This would give them complete control over every part of their backend but it's prohibitively expensive and time consuming for a new company with a small team of engineers. Instead, Fortress IO can take advantage of a cloud hosting service. There are several types of cloud hosting services that abstract away the, the backend to varying degrees. An infrastructure as a service product like a DigitalOcean droplet would have the highest degree of control but the lowest degree of abstraction. This type of provider would host the server infrastructure in the cloud so Fortress IO engineers wouldn't have to purchase, configure, and maintain backend hardware, but they would still need to configure and maintain the operating system and application code. Alternatively, a platform as a service provider like Heroku would handle all of the hardware and the operating system, letting the engineers at Fortress IO focus on the backend application code. This is a good option, but Fortress IO primarily needs common backend functionality. So coding a backend application might be considered inefficient. Another option for Fortress IO is a backend as a service product like Google Firebase that generates a pre-built backend so that the Fortress IO engineers don't even have to worry about the backend code at all. This provides the highest degree of abstraction and will let Fortress IO get their products to market the fastest, but the trade-off is that Fortress IO engineers are no longer in control of their backend, not even the code. This means that the engineers at Fortress IO can't customize their backend if they need to implement a new feature in the future. One way that BAS providers try to address their limited customizability is through a feature commonly known as cloud code, although it goes by other names. Cloud code allows your application to automatically run functions on the server side in response to events triggered by HTTP requests, letting users take advantage of the benefits of a BAS provider even if they need functionality that isn't natively supported by that BAS provider. One specific use case for cloud code is integrating with third-party APIs, which is something that Fortress IO needs to do. For example, Fortress IO might decide to use Stripe for their payment system. If they hard code the Stripe secret API key in their front-end code, then anyone who inspects their front-end code will be able to access their API key. 
If Fortress.io decides to use a BAS provider without cloud code, then they won't be able to securely integrate Stripe into their application. But if their BAS provider does have cloud code, then the Fortress.io engineers can define a custom function in the backend with access to the Stripe secret API key. And then they can call that function from the front end using an HTTP request. So using the Stripe scenario I just described as an example, here's how the cloud code functionality could work. First, the engineers at Fortress.io define a custom function called charge customer that uses Stripe to request payment from a customer. In this function, they import the Stripe client library and make the API key available, either by hard coding it or as an environment variable. This function and its dependencies then get injected into the backend provided by the BAS. Since the code gets injected into the backend, the API key is secure. It no longer lives in the front end where it could be compromised. Now, when Fortress IO processes a customer payment on the front end using Stripe, they have the front end code make an HTTP request to the back end. This request will invoke the charge customer cloud code function that was previously injected into the back end. Once the charge customer function is invoked on the back end, it will make an API call to Stripe. Then the back end forwards Stripe's response to the front end that originally made the cloud code request. This is just one example of how cloud code is a useful feature for a backend as a service provider. So the engineers at Fortress IO have decided to use a BAS provider with cloud code, but they still need to decide whether to use a managed or a self-hosted BAS service. With a managed BAS product like Google Firebase or AWS Amplify, the backend code and infrastructure is hosted and maintained by the BAS provider. And so the code and infrastructure isn't accessible to the team at Fortress IO. On the other hand, with an open source self-hosted BAS product like AppWrite or Parse, consumers download the entire code base and deploy the backend themselves. For these providers, the Fortress IO engineers would be responsible for deploying and maintaining the backend. So what kind of BAS provider should Fortress IO choose? A managed or a self-hosted one? Let's look at the pros and cons of each. A managed BAS is easier to deploy than a self-hosted BAS, so they will get their product to market more quickly with a managed BAS. A self-hosted BAS, though, will give them more control. So they'll be able to modify the backend code or infrastructure if they need to, which isn't possible with a managed BAS. A managed BAS requires essentially no configuration and provides support for their product, while a self-hosted BAS requires configuration and offers no support. Finally, a self-hosted BAS will give them ownership over their backend, which lets them avoid vendor lock-in, which is one of the most common complaints about managed BAS products. Vendor lock-in occurs with managed BAS providers because you have to design and implement your application around the interfaces that they provide, locking you into their services. This makes it difficult if you ever need to modify your application or migrate your application away from the managed BAS service. For example, if the BAS provider ceases to exist, then you'll have to create a backend from scratch or figure out how to migrate your application to a new BAS provider. This has happened several times in recent years, including when Facebook dropped support for Parse in 2017, and when Microsoft retired their mobile backend as a service in 2020. So if Fortress IO wants to keep control of their backend, avoid vendor lock-in, and still get their product to market quickly, what should they do? This is where Bastion comes in. Bastion is an open source backend as a service that gets deployed to the cloud using AWS. We designed Bastion for small companies like Fortress IO that want to get their product to market quickly while still keeping control of their code and infrastructure. Bastion also supports cloud code, letting users define custom functions that get executed using AWS Lambdas, allowing users to more easily integrate with third-party APIs. We also made sure to make Bastion secure and scalable out of the box. So to get Bastion up and running, first you need to install the AWS CLI on your local machine and connect it with your AWS account. Then install the Bastion CLI and enter the command Bastion deploy to deploy the admin app to your AWS account. So now you'll have access to the admin dashboard, which will let you create a backend for your project. For example, you can create a backend for your restaurant app as seen here. This backend also gets deployed to your AWS account and will handle the backend functionality that you need for your restaurant app. With Bastion, you can deploy multiple backends for multiple projects. 
If you wanted to deploy a separate backend for your shopping app, you can do that and then have two separate and independent backends operating in your AWS account. To interact with these backends in your front end code, you can download the Bastion client SDK and use the methods that it provides for database operations, user authentication, file storage, and cloud code functions. Now I'll pass it off to Pavlo, who will give a more detailed overview of Bastion. Thank you, Adam. We're gonna start with this diagram, which we will revisit a few times as we go over the different parts of Bastion. In the following slides, we're gonna walk through the process of how they are created and discuss each one in more detail, starting with the CLI. Deploying your infrastructure starts with the Bastion CLI. This is a downloadable NPM package, which provides several helpful commands. Once it is installed, the Bastion help command will list all available commands, as well as other helpful information, which you should see in just a moment. To deploy Bastion to your AWS account, you first need to download and log into the AWS CLI, which will verify the AWS account to which Bastion will be deployed. Once logged in, you can enter Bastion deploy and follow the prompts to get started. You will need to provide a domain where Bastion will be hosted, as well as some additional information. You'll be prompted to choose a username and a password will be generated that can be used along with that username to log into the admin application. Once you have followed all of the prompts, a CloudFormation script will run, which will automatically provision the infrastructure in AWS needed to run the administrative part of Bastion or the admin application. You can use the Bastion show command to see a list of your deployed infrastructure and the username and password for each instance. If you forget to write that down, you can find that information here. And when you are finished with a particular Bastion account, entering Bastion destroy allows you to tear it down. The next part that we will cover is the admin application, which is made up of the admin dashboard and the admin app server, and is used to manage and deploy Bastion backends like the shopping app backend and the restaurant app backend shown here. Here we see a more detailed overview of the infrastructure of Bastion. We'll cover the architecture in more detail later, but this diagram illustrates how Bastion is deployed to AWS. The admin application is the part that's in focus now. When Bastion is first deployed, a CloudFormation script creates a new virtual private cloud, which contains the admin app and any individual Bastion backends that are created from there. All traffic coming from outside the VPC is first routed to an application load balancer, which then routes it to its next destination. Requests from the admin app dashboard running in a browser are routed to the admin app server, which is a Node.js application built with Express and a MongoDB instance for data storage. Both the Express application and MongoDB run in Docker containers managed by AWS Elastic Container Service with Fargate. Uh, here we can see the admin dashboard. And once you log in, you are presented with information about each of your Bastion backends, such as when they were created, their names and API keys. The keys are essential for the Bastion SDK, which is used by front-end applications to communicate with the Bastion backends. We will cover the SDK in more detail later. From this screen, we can create new backends, delete existing backends, or see information specific to each one. Creating a Bastion backend will run another CloudFormation script, which will once again provision infrastructure on AWS to create a backend for your front-end application. Clicking on a Bastion backend in the sidebar of the dashboard will show you details about that instance. The links on the sidebar will change to allow you to navigate between collections, users, cloud code, and files. And when you are done, you can log out of the dashboard. The collections tab uh, shows all the collections that exist in that Bastion backend. This is where collections are created and destroyed. Manipulating the data within those collections can be done using the SDK. The Users tab allows user management to help you decide who has access to your front-end application. Here you can see a list of all existing users, delete users, and create new ones. The Cloud Code tab allows you to see all of the Cloud Code functions that you have created. It allows you to create new ones and delete any that you no longer have a need for. Creating a Cloud Code function requires uploading a zip file containing the code you wish to run, as well as any dependencies that it requires. Doing this will create uh, will cause the admin app to create a new AWS Lambda function, which can be invoked quickly and easily using the methods provided in the SDK. 
These functions can provide additional functionality that your backend requires, such as communicating with third-party APIs or filtering or transforming your application data. There is also a Files tab, which allows you to view uploaded files associated with each Bastion backend. The admin application consists of a front-end interface, the dashboard we just looked at, and a backend which handles basic create, read, update, and delete actions from the dashboard and stores data about existing Bastion backends. The purpose of the admin app is to create and manage those backends. Application one and application two in this diagram represent two separate Bastion backends created by the admin user. Creating a new backend from the dashboard creates a new cluster on AWS ECS, which pulls Docker images from AWS Elastic Container Registry to create the necessary tasks to run a Bastion backend. Any actions on the admin dashboard concerning collections, users, files, or cloud code functions are forwarded to the appropriate cluster. All of the necessary infrastructure is created using a cloud formation script. Next, we will dive a little deeper into the structure and function of the Bastion backends created by the admin application. And here we have a slightly more complete look at the Bastion infrastructure. The parts in orange represent Bastion app servers and database servers running on ECS, Fargate, uh, each backend running on their own ECS cluster. Each cluster runs two services, one of which is an express server providing the backend API for our clients' front end projects, and the other is a MongoDB server for data storage. The server and MongoDB instances run as separate services, allowing the app server to scale independently of the DB server. AWS Cloud Map provides service discovery between server instances and DB instances. Data in the database server is persisted using Docker volumes and the AWS Elastic File System. File storage is provided using S3, and cloud code functions are deployed as AWS Lambdas. So the Bastion back, uh, backend provides basic BAS functionality. It handles requests both from the admin application and the front-end applications built with the Bastion SDK, providing services such as authentication, execution of cloud code functions, file storage, and database operations. One of the most basic actions that the Bastion backend handles is creating collections and storing and man manipulating collection data. If we create a collection named examples from the admin app, a request is sent to the Bastion backend. The collection is created and stored in that instance's database server, and API endpoints are dynamically created on the app server, providing basic CRUD functionality. File storage is initiated using the Bastion SDK. Files are uploaded to the app server, which uploads the file to its designated S3 bucket. The bucket returns an object, which includes the file's URL, which is stored in the database server. This way, when a read request comes in for a particular file, the server only has to return the URL instead of returning the file in its entirety. The final part of Bastion is a client SDK, which is what connects front-end applications to their respective Bastion backends. Using the client SDK, a developer has access to methods which provide CRUD actions on collections in the database, login, sign up, and logout functionality, methods that run custom cloud code, and grant access to file storage. Now, this uh, snapshot here from the admin dashboard shows one of the main pieces of information needed for the SDK to connect to a Bastion backend, which is the API key. Each backend has its own unique API key. Using the SDK requires downloading and importing it into the file where it'll be used. The initialize method returns an object that grants all the methods necessary to interact with the Bastion backend. This method requires the domain name that is chosen when first deploying Bastion and the unique API key. And here we see a list of some of the methods the SDK provides that allows developers to interact with the Bastion backend. For example, to get all of the items in a collection, you can use the db.getAllItems method passing it the name of the desired collection. With that basic overview of Bastion, I will now pass it to Alijan, who will cover some of the design decisions that we made when building Bastion and its architecture. Thank you, Paolo. Um, Bastion is cloud native. It's designed to be flexible, resilient, and manageable. Considering these, it was an easy choice to use Docker containers to build our backend servers and the admin application. To understand what containers provide, we can compare them to one of the alternatives. The key difference between virtual machines and containers is the need for the hypervisor layer and guest operating systems. 
Docker containers do not need their operating system and the hypervisor layer. They share the host operating system's kernel through the Docker daemon. This, this makes Dockerized applications light run faster, overall more resource efficient. Dockerized applications are not perfect. They require de deployment, management, and scaling. They can fail uh, and require reprovisioning. So we need a system that can take care of these. This is when Docker co the container orchestration comes into play. In AWS environment, we could have used two services, Amazon's Elastic Container Service ECS or Amazon's Managed Kubernetes Service EKS. Kubernetes is an open source solution to container orchestration. It is very popular because it allows building highly scalable applications. Kubernetes is also platform agnostic. This is a difference maker in a scenario where you are considering multi-cloud deploy deployment or flexibility of changing your cloud provider. However, Kubernetes requires a good understanding of its underlying principles, and lack of experience could cause higher cost and performance inefficiencies. ECS, however, is an AWS managed container orchestration service. It has better integration with AWS and is simpler to use. Another important factor for consideration here is our target users. Fortress IO is a relatively small team with minimal to no infrastructure experience. In a scenario where Fortress IO team wanted to make changes in their Bastion infrastructure, working with ECS will be easier. Now we've, we've chosen to use ECS. Let's look into ECS modes for launching applications. With EC2 mode, you own servers which you manage and maintain. Since you own the infrastructure, you pay for the infrastructure for the period you run the instances. With Fargate mode, AWS allocates you the resources, compute resources as you need them. You don't control the infrastructure piece, and this brings certain advantages. Firstly, Fargate has a pay-as-you-go pricing. You pay for the resources you consume. And another advantage of Fargate is that you don't have to choose an instance type at the start. AWS recommends EC2 for EC2 mode for large workloads optimized for price. And it recommends Fargate mode for large workloads optimized for low admin overhead and for any mid to small workload. For Bastion, we needed a way to easily deploy or tear down backends, and Fargate was a better choice for this. Let's look into different ECS configurations we've used in Bastion to solve different problems. On the left, you can see our admin application. And on the right, there is the Bastion backend configuration, which is deployed for each backend you create. For the admin app, the expected traffic is relatively low. A single administrator or a small development team will use this application when they want to add new backends or new features to one of their existing backends. Because we aren't expecting high traffic on the admin application, there was no need to configure auto-scaling. Due to the same reason, the database and the application containers can run in the same task. For the Bastion backend, however, it is expected to receive high traffic since hundreds or thousands of clients could send requests to the backend infrastructure. Assuming this, the application server will be the first performance bottleneck, we first separated the application server and the database server into separate ECS services. Next, we enabled auto-scaling for the service that the application server is located in. This will scale the application servers horizontally by adding more instances when it's needed. We haven't done this for our database server since databases can handle higher traffic. In our case, we use MongoDB, and MongoDB can handle more than 50,000 concurrent requests. Uh, for Bastion, we decided to use a document database over a relational database. Because we didn't want to force our users to define a schema and the relationships between models before they use them. This way, users can create a collection and start manipulating data straight away. We also chose Mongo over AWS Managed DynamoDB due to the ease of local development. 
This brings us to our current configuration where we run database servers as Docker containers inside ECS tasks that you can see in this slide. There is one problem with running containerized applications in the cloud. Your ECS Fargate tasks can crash or need it to be reprovisioned. In this case, AWS does not guarantee that your containers will be deployed on the same host. This would cause data loss. To solve the data persistent problem, we use Docker volumes and AWS Elastic File System. EFS mount points will be attached to the Docker volumes we defined. This way, even if you stop, start, or reprovision your instances, your data will be there. Another common feature of past solutions is a dedicated file storage. If Fortress IO decide to implement a social media, for example, they need a storage solution where they save media files like profile images or videos. For file storage, we could have used MongoDB with grid file system, which divides large files into multiple parts. However, we opted for S3 due to its simplicity. When the client application sends a file to an app server, first, this will be uploaded to a public read allowed S3 bucket that is dedicated to a single bastion backend. The S3 URL of the uploaded object will be saved to the database in files collection. When the client application sends a read request for the same file later on, our application server will retrieve this uh, file information from the database and return this S3 URL instead of the streaming the entire file back. Then the client application is responsible for using the S3 URL according to the application logic. This could be displaying the image or creating a download link. This way we don't send these large files back and forth and we reduce the load on our application servers. Let's look into how we split responsibility between different parts of Bastion. We already know that CLI deploys the base, the base infrastructure and runs the admin application. Naturally, the admin application handles creating and managing Bastion backends. It's important to understand the shared responsibility between the client, client applications, hence the client SDKs and the admin application. The admin application is responsible for the functionality that we would like to hide from client applications. For collections, this means client applications can create read, update, delete data from an existing collection, but creating, deleting collections are constrained to the admin app. For cloud of code functions, we want the client applications to be able to trigger the execution of these uh, cloud code functions. For example, running the charge customer function, but the management of these functions are handled by the admin app. Cloud code is one of the key features of Bastion. Any custom functionality of your app, of application will be defined as a cloud code function. We discussed some of the details earlier. When designing Bastion, we considered two ways of implementing cloud code functions. We could either de deploy to tear down small containerized applications each time a cloud code function is created or removed. However, this would create a lot of configuration overhead in addition to being, being more expensive and resource inefficient. Instead, we decided to use lambdas. Provisioning lambdas is easier. They are cheaper as you pay for per execution with a significant amount of free allowance. Lambdas are a better fit for running specific well-contained tasks, which cloud code functions are by definition. Before we move on and talk about Bastion architecture, there is one, one last thing we want to mention briefly. We talked about the relationship between Bastion CLI and the admin application previously. When you deploy your Bastion VPC using the CLI application, your configuration information along with your admin username and password will be passed down to the admin application's environment variables. This way, the admin app can be aware of the configuration and login settings and use them when creating and managing Bastion backends. Now we will talk about some of the decisions we made at a higher level and talk about Bastion architecture. After a user creates their Bastion VPC, let's assume they logged into their admin dashboard 
and provision two bastion backends with a bunch of cloud code functions on each bastion backend. This is what their bastion VPC would look like as a whole. Now we will zoom into some of these parts and talk about some of the components. First, let's focus on the initial state of your Bastion VPC as it's provisioned by the CLA application without any Bastion backends. While designing Bastion VPC, security was one of our main considerations. Bastion uses four subnets, each serves to a specific purpose. One private subnet called database tier contains Bastion backend database servers. One private subnet called application tier contains Bastion backend servers, admin application, and cloud code functions. Basically all the main compute components. Lastly, we have two public subnets containing internet facing networking components. This way by default, there will be no public access available to your key components. And this will be handled by the networking components explicitly. Another key consideration behind Bastion's design is future growth. Bastion is designed for small teams, scalability considered up to a certain degree. We expect our users to employ their own backend and infrastructure engineering teams in case they start growing really fast. And we designed Bastion VPC in a way that it can be taken over by these teams without the need for redeploying an infrastructure from scratch. We use a single AZ to deploy our infrastructure considering cost in mind. We've done the IP design in a way that in total Bastion uses 25% of the available IPs in your VPC. This way, if you decide to add more functionality in the future by taking over the Bastion VPC, or if you choose to achieve higher availability by deploying your servers into multiple availability zones, you will have the room available. We deploy your Bastion VPC into the hosted zone that you provide. For this, you need a domain that you own and an AWS hosted zone. If your domain is registered by other registrars, this is completely okay. You can use AWS Route 53's DNS hosting to get your hosted zone. Or if you are registering a new domain, you can just use R53, both for registration and for DNS hosting. We mentioned that we deploy your admin application to the app tier private subnet. Now let's look into how we allow traffic to your admin application. Initially, we create an application load balancer configured so that by default, it forwards the traffic to your admin application. By simply accessing to your domain, you can log into your admin dashboard with your username and password and start using Bastion. At this stage, this is a very straightforward configuration, but what happens when you add a Bastion backend? When you log into your admin app with your username and password and click create stack, first cloud core formation will initiate a stack creation. The cloud formation script uses the image from a public ECR repository that we created. This will deploy your Bastion backend into the same app tier subnet and you can repeat this step as many times as you want. One advantage of using cloud formation is, to, is the control over the various resources you provision as part of your stack. Our app servers are now configured, but we have a problem. How are we going to allow traffic to these servers from client applications that we're going to build? In addition to deploying your instances, CloudFormation also configures our application load balancer rules. We use path-based routing to direct incoming traffic to the relevant Bastion backend server. Request URL will be checked and using the matching listener rule, routing will be handled. We talked about incoming traffic, but what about the outgoing traffic? Earlier in our presentation, we discussed cloud code functions that you can deploy. These should be able to connect to payment APIs, messaging APIs, or other services that exist in, on the public internet. Additionally, your ECS tasks would require access to public ECR repositories where we hold our Docker images so that the containers can be provisioned. We use an app gateway to achieve this. First, all the outgoing traffic from your private subnets will be routed to the web tier subnet. Here, a NAT gateway takes care of the rest. Let's see how. 
NAT Gateway is a smart networking service that uses a process called IP masquerading. It takes outgoing IP packets that are sent by components with private IPs and replaces these with its own public IP. Then it forwards them to the target. When a response is received, it forwards these back by replacing the receiver IP with the original sender IP. We have a few other interesting architectural and code level challenges we tackled while building Bastion. Now Riley will talk about these and give you a demo of what Fortress IO can build using Bastion. Uh, great, thank you, Alijan. Uh, throughout the process of creating Bastion, we experienced many challenges, but some of the most prominent were handling user authentication, figuring out how to get database servers and application servers to communicate with each other, and also in our implementation of our cloud code functions. For our Bastion backend servers, we wanted to make sure that each user's data is secure and only accessible to those that have been authenticated. For this, we decided to use session cookies to uniquely identify users. So when a user initially logs in, they are given a cookie from the server that is stored in the browser. At the same time, the server creates a session token in our database that can be later be used to check if a user session is valid. Now, when a request is sent from a user to a server, the cookie sent in the request is authenticated against the token in the session store. If there is a match, the session is considered valid and the server returns the requested resource to the client. In order for cookies to be sent to the client, we need to make sure that they are secure. For these to be secure, they must be sent over HTTPS. This is necessary so that malicious actors cannot access them to perform actions on a client's behalf. Because we had to use HTTPS, that meant we had to be able to create and issue SSL certificates for our users. If our load balancer forwarded requests using HTTPS, each backend server in our application tier would also require an SSL certificate. Using HTTPS at this layer is also unnecessary as all of the traffic is between our private services. So all of the extra encryption is a waste of resources. So what we can do instead is to create and issue just one SSL certificate for our load balancer. From here, the load balancer can forward all requests over HTTP instead of HTTPS using a process called SSL offloading. Now we won't have to worry about issuing more certificates and we have the benefit of relieving our server from the burden of encrypting and decrypting secure traffic each time it receives a request, saving valuable resources for our server. One significant challenge with using HTTPS to secure our cookies is in how our load balancer talks with our application server. Internally on our private network, we convert all of the HTTPS requests to HTTP in SSL offloading that I mentioned before. The issue with this is that requests with cookies would be sent to our load balancer over HTTPS and then would be routed to our app server over HTTP. This process would cause cookies to be refused even though they were still technically secure. To solve this problem, we were able to configure our server to use something called a trust proxy. This basically tells the server that it can trust the request that is one network jump away, which is where our load balancer is located. Since we know that the load balancer receives requests over HTTPS, we know that it hasn't been tampered with and that the server can trust it. This will in turn allow the cookie to pass through and to be accessible to our application server. Another challenge we faced was determining the best way for application servers and database servers to communicate with each other. Each application server stores their data in a separate database so that we can separate concerns. This means that each app server has to know which database to talk to. There are several ways to achieve this, but we mostly considered the following options. Option one is to use an internal load balancer, which would serve as a centralized location for managing all connections between each service. App servers would be able to route traffic through this load balancer, which then decides on the database server to route the request to. The other option is to use service discovery using AWS Cloud Map, which allows for direct communication between application and database containers. Cloud Map allows you to register container tasks with a custom name, which gets resolved to the internal IP address of the container. When a new backend, Bastion backend is created, the user gives it a name, which is then used to create a new private DNS namespace for the server. 
we can then use that name in other services to refer to it. We ended up choosing this option since we wanted to avoid the extra infrastructure and complexity of the internal load balancer uh, option. It would lead to higher costs and increased maintenance. So we decided to go with CloudMap. Figuring out how to properly implement our cloud code functionality was also a pretty big challenge. We had to figure out how we would go about creating our functions along with all of their dependencies. We also didn't want just anyone to be able to create these since they can have far reaching effects. So we limited the creation of cloud code functions to our ab admin application. We also had to figure out how our customers would be executing these bits of functionality and how we would get them to be able to interact with resources within their AWS infrastructure, as well as being able to interact with resources available through the public internet, like external APIs. For creation of our cloud code functions, since we decided to go the route of zip files, we didn't want to go the route of inserting inline code, which CloudFormation allows. Though it is a more direct way to create lambdas, it makes it hard to add dependencies and inserting code as a string can get messy very quickly. The other option was to upload a zip file with all its dependencies to an S3 bucket first. From here, Lambda can pull all the necessary files that it needs. This is a much cleaner process, but it did involve adding another piece of infrastructure to our pro project by adding the private S3 bucket. For the invocation of our cloud code functions, we ran into the challenge of making sure our functions can interact with other private AWS resources, as well as resources available through the public internet. The public access method, which you can see on the right, is straightforward. No configuration is needed, and it uses default internet access. Unfortunately, while it is able to reach out to external resources like third-party APIs, it isn't able to interact with your own AWS resources. To allow our cloud code functions to interact with existing resources would take some configuration. We would have to make sure we configured our functions with the correct security credentials to work within our VPC. And we would also have to give them the correct subnet information so they had access to the components within our infrastructure. This is the option you see on the left. With this configured correctly, we were able to make sure that our cloud code functions could add as much functionality as possible while staying secure. So now I will demonstrate an example application that has been created to integrate with Bastion. It utilizes our SDK to communicate with created Bastion backends. So all the functionality you will see interacts with the Bastion backend servers created from the admin dashboard. Once again, you initialize it in your front end code like so by downloading and importing the NPM package and using your server information as the input so that you can access all of the relevant resources for your application. As you can see here, this front end application created by a client can use our SDK modules to easily integrate the functionality that they need. Here, I am able to create new users as well as log existing users in and out. Dealing with database collections is straightforward as well, as I am able to perform all necessary CRUD actions on items in my database. Here, I'm creating a new record to add to our database collection and displaying all available entries. Users also have the ability to easily upload files, which creates an entry in the database that has the relevant URL for retrieving that file to handle in any manner that a front end developer chooses. So this could be creating a download link or simply displaying an image. If they want to get this file by its ID and display it, it's as simple as displaying the public S3 URL retrieved from the database that you saw previously. Before I show you how cloud code functions are used, take a look at how, at how Fortress IO is implementing them in their front end. You'll see on line six, they're using bastion.ccf.run to use our SDK to interact with the Bastion backend. They pass in the name of their function and any parameters they might need. On lines 14 through 16, you'll see that they can run their cloud code functions that have been previously defined in the admin dashboard to interact with Stripe's API. Here, you will see that although our application doesn't natively support taking payments from users, it is possible to add that functionality yourself to our backend. From here, you can then use our SDK in the code you saw previously to execute that functionality in the front end that you're looking at now. The cloud code functions demonstrated here are hitting a real Stripe API endpoint to make charges to customers. 
They also allow you to hit the Stripe API to display your real Stripe account balance and to hit the Stripe API again to list your current customers. You can see all three of those functions here. The important thing to note is that the Stripe API key lives in our Cloud Code functions within our backend, so it never gets exposed to those trying to get access to your Stripe account through your Stripe API key. Obviously, this is a time box project and work never truly feels finished. So here are a few things that we have thought about for further development of Bastion. Um, one thing we'd like to add is um, the ability to whitelist front-end domains. It's one way we'd like to improve the security of client applications interacting with Bastion. Um, we'd like to provide the ability to whitelist domains that are allowed to communicate with the Bastion backend. That man can make a list of domains that are allowed to access each um, server, drastically reducing the danger of API key exposure. Um, currently, our SDK only supports JavaScript for front-end web developers. We'd like to uh, add support for other languages if possible, like Java and Swift and others for mobile developers. Um, we'd also like to add the ability to use Redis for session storage. We currently use MongoDB, and while it fits our use case pretty well currently, uh, Redis is able to handle session storage a little more efficiently at scale. Um, and another way we'd like to improve Bastion is to deploy it in another availability zone. An availability zone going down in AWS isn't unheard of, so if we were deployed in multiple, Bastion could be more available to our customers and more resilient against outages. Um, and yeah, this is the end of our presentation. Thank you for coming and we hope you enjoyed it. Now we'll take some time to answer questions from the audience. So you can put those in chat or in the Q&A. All right, so we have a question. The question is, I'm wondering how you ended up going in this exciting direction. How did you arrive at this idea? So I guess we, we were pretty interested in backend as a service, um, I think pretty early. And we were looking at different ways that they were implemented and different features we could implement and how to differentiate ourselves. Um, and we kind of stumbled on this version of it where it's cloud hosted and we made sure to use cloud code as a, as a key feature because that seemed to be something that people really wanted in a lot of their backend as a service providers. So I think it kind of evolved just from the very beginning from our just general interest in backend as a service. Um, I can also add to that in that I, I think I like the topic of backend as a service because it touches so many other topics. You, know, you get to touch data, working with data, user authentication, working with a little bit of front end, a little bit of back end, and getting everything to communicate in the right way. So I think solving like a multitude of problems across the board is something that interested me at least. Okay, so the question is for the Fortress IO application, is that an app that just develop the developers at Fortress IO would use internally? Could you be a bit more clear on how Bastion would provide backend services for the front end, if that makes sense? Uh, yeah, I can answer that. Um, so I guess that was more of um, a prototype just to kind of show off how any kind of functionality could be used. Um, in theory, it would be something that a front-end developer uh, builds and they could have their users use that application. So then that user could sign and interact with data in any way that they saw fit, if that answers your question, hopefully. <laughs> Oh, we have another question. What's the benefit of running an open source BAS on your own infrastructure? Yeah, so having it be open source lets you have control over the code and infrastructure. And that might not matter in the beginning when you're just using sort of simple functionality. But if, you're, if your application grows and you wanna scale or you wanna make any kind of modification, um, if you're in control of the code and the architecture, then you can actually just jump in and make the changes you need to. Like, for example, if you wanted to modify, say you wanted to modify your Bastion backend server, you could just access the code from our repository and then just make whatever changes you want. 
create a container and then just switch out that container for the one that's running in ECS, which is something that we did um, many, many times during development. So it's not a very difficult process and it, it, it lets you have Bastion be a functional part of your infrastructure for longer, essentially, instead of like a managed bad service where if you need to change something or if there's some functionality that you don't have, you, you're kind of out of luck because the entire code is completely obfuscated. Uh, could you talk more about how you use Cloud Map to connect containers in private subnets? So Cloud Map essentially is like an internal private uh, DNS. So when we create a Bastion backend, we give it we create a new namespace, which is just a, a like a place for it to live and a name you can use to access it. And then when you use that namespace in another container, like if you're you need an URL, you can just use that like um, like the URL. You can just say like name dot or db dot name, and then that'll resolve to the address of another service um, that you registered it with. So it's a lot like DNS for the public internet, but it essentially lives in AWS. Oh, we have another question. Uh, would a BAS like Bastion be suitable for running a microservice architecture, like have multiple Bastion instances communicating with each other to form a system? I can answer that. Um, I guess um, the use case of Bastion is not to have an microservices architecture. Um, the other part is because by definition, backend uh, instances are not modifiable. Um, like our current configuration doesn't allow that. Uh, but if, some, if, if someone takes over our architecture and, in, and, and modifies our Docker images, this is, this is completely possible. But the, the use case of backend as a service is not something like microservices architecture. The, the users, of, users are small teams with mostly uh, front-end developers that, that they don't wanna uh, build backends. They just wanna focus on the front-end part. So they just need a server basically. Uh, thanks. Thanks for watching our presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you.